Hello, and welcome to Modern Web. My name is Tara Hampton with this dot, and I will be your host today. Uh, thank you all for joining us as we combine all four of our regions together for the first time. And um, we hope that you are all well and staying safe and practicing social distancing. We're super excited to have so many great partners for this event, um, all the way from the Triangle, um, Northwest Arkansas, Kansas City, and the Bay Area. Um, so thank you to our partners. Um, let's see. We have a lot of amazing sponsors here today. Um, first up, we have TJ with Progress Kendo React. Hey everyone. Yeah, I'm TJ from the Kendo React team. You can learn more about us at kendoreact.com. Essentially, we are a suite of React components. So if you need basic components from date pickers, uh, form controls, things like that, all the way up to you need a data grid for your app or a schedule or something really robust, you can use Kendo React. If you're looking for a component suite to standardize, maybe you have a lot of different apps that you're building and you want something consistent you could use throughout your apps. We have a lot of our customers and users using that as well. So React components, really good ones. Check it out at kendareact.com. Thank you so much. Um, our next sponsor um, is All Things Open. Um, unfortunately, Tog could not make it here tonight, um, but they have switched their conference to a virtual platform. So please be sure to check them out online. Um, and next we have James with Commerce Tools. Hi everyone. Uh, as mentioned, I'm James with Commerce Tools. Dina uh, couldn't make it here today. It's our first time sponsoring Modern Web, so we're pretty excited. Just want to tell you a little bit about Commerce Tools. Uh, we're a tech company focused on commerce. We're worldwide, but our U.S. office is here in Durham, North Carolina, along with a lot of remote U.S. employees that we support. We're doing lots of cool tech things across languages, across clouds. And we're a very diverse company uh, with a focus on diversity and a lot of nationalities represented. Uh, what we do is build a suite of APIs that people use to build really awesome commerce experiences, uh, which brings us a lot of unique and interesting companies doing you know, cool things. This is just a small lineup of who's working with commerce tools. Um, mainly want to push that we're a different kind of company that's developer led. You know, 80% of our C-suite are all tech. Uh, we're pushing open source. We're building cool platforms like Sangria, which is the leading GraphQL implementation for Scala. We built the Mock Alliance to push this idea of API-driven uh, development. And we're big on the community. Things like Modern Web is amazing. Uh, and lastly, I just want to call out that we are hiring. So whether you're a developer, DevOps, architect, or trainer, we definitely need you from across the US. So put the link up there. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, James. And last but not least, the Stat Labs, your partners in digital or modern digital transformation, specializing in mentorship, consulting, training, and staff augmentation for enterprise organizations. You can find out more at this.labs.com or send us an email at hi at this.co. Our speakers today are Drew Wallets, Director of Education at NWA 3D and Robert Abu Khalil, a bioinformatics software engineer, that was a tongue twister, at Invite. Uh, gentlemen, welcome and thank you so much for being here. We are excited Absolutely. to hear what you have to say in just a few moments. And if any of you are familiar with this dot, you may already know that we put on weekly meetups online covering various frameworks and topics. Um, the SOTS online meetups are an amazing opportunity for developers and enthusiasts alike to engage with the global tech community, no matter where you are in the world. Um, you can find out the latest schedule and get links to join at this.co. And here is a schedule for tonight's events. Um, we'll kick it off with Drew giving us a talk on how digital manufacturing and specifically 3D printing is changing the way we learn and interact with the world. Then we'll take a quick break and play a little fun game of JavaScript Jeopardy. Um, before we get started with Robert, who will give us a whirlwind tour of WebAssembly. So I'm pretty excited about hearing what you guys have to say. And on that note, I am going to hand the mic over to you, Drew. Sweet. 
All right, well, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, I am Drew Wallace and I work with 3D printing. So I am the Director of Education at NWA 3D and we are an educational 3D printing company that specializes in uh, supplying 3D printers and training for schools across the country. So that's what we've been doing for about the past five years. And then I also work with a company called MakerMade who makes the CNC machine called the Maslow and also the M2, which there's one behind me right here. And I am super passionate about different types of digital manufacturing. So there's a lot of different types of manufacturing out there and digital manufacturing basically means you can take something from a computer and then get a robot to build it, whether it be a 3D printer or a CNC machine, which is where it's actually cutting something out. Um, also like a laser cutter would be an example of that too, where you're actually cutting something out with a laser. So where you can actually come up with an idea and then bring it to reality. So to talk about the way that it's been changing um, our world, it's it's sometimes called a disruptive technology because it's kind of what it's doing. It's throwing a wrench into every the different ways that traditional things would happen. So a lot of times you'll have, um, someone will have an idea and then they have to get someone to make it. And then that person will, will be far away from them and they'll have to make a prototype or a design and they'll have to cut it by hand and then they'll have to ship it back all the way back to you. And then you get to look at it and then, oh, do you, I, this thing needs to change and that thing needs to change. And then you have to ship that part back to someone else. And that whole process, how things traditionally would get made takes a really long time. Well, in the past decade with the advent of personal 3D printing and personal CNC machines and laser cutters, that has cut that process down to where you can do a lot of that yourself. So either in-house for a business or as a hobbyist who wants to make something in their room or uh, their garage or something like that, they can come up with an idea on a computer, design it themselves, and then actually get the robot to create it. So it takes a lot of the mystery out of that process because you can actually develop a product and get a product that actually works. And then you can take that working product to a factory to get it mass manufactured where they can make a mold of it and make tons and tons of things. Or you can do something really small and customized where you can work on something such as creating, you know, benches for a park or signs or working on prototypes for different types of engine components or all types of different ways that you can utilize digital manufacturing. And nearly and every engineering firm now utilizes 3D printing in some way because it's a different way to create something. So it's it's creating something basically out of nothing. You're bringing something from a screen to real life. And it works as kind of like a hot glue gun. So uh, if you've never seen the 3D printer before, it's basically melting down a material or turning one material into another, which is the form that you've designed on your computer. Um, that main type of 3D printing that is most accessible to people is called desktop 3D printing um, or FDM, Fused Deposition Modeling, because those different layers are kind of fused together. And behind me, you can kind of see I got some printers going right here. So let me change my camera and then uh, we can talk a little bit about them. There we go. So you can see it's taken this material and this is actually making a flower pot right now to, to go out in my garden where layer by layer by layer, it builds that material from scratch. So you start with this material, which is called filament. And then this filament is actually melted down in the hot end. And I can kind of turn this down here so you can see it's actually a nozzle that's melting the material down to create your shape. So as we're walking about, talking about this and talking about different types of uh, 3D printing, if you have any questions that about something that I'm talking about or anything that's 3D printed or digital manufacturing related, go ahead and throw it in the comments. And then when I get to the end, I can take questions and kind of talk about it and kind of go over everything. So with uh, 3D printing, and it's particularly having 3D printing in schools, the thing that's really awesome about it is students can take a design or something that they're thinking about and then they can make that design real. So it's not just learning how to 3D print is why 3D printing is important to education, but it's all those other steps that can go into it. So it changes the way that you are thinking about the world because instead of just saying, oh, this is broken, I need to go buy a new one. You could say, this is broken, how can I fix that? You can actually make that fix or repair something that's already been broken or come up with an entirely new idea. So it's basically creating makers instead of consumers where you're thinking about how this problem can be solved yourself without looking at anyone else. And this type of empowerment by skill building is really powerful 
because you can just take something that you think of and then it's there. And that process of going through that though, there's so much to learn from. So as you're making something like this flower pot and you're designing this, there's so much that you're learning besides you know how the machine works that can go into how you're actually gonna 3D print. You're learning the design aspects of what you need to do. You're learning the programming aspects, which is called slicing, which you can do in a different program that it actually has to be converted for this machine itself. And then the third thing that you're doing is you're actually running this machine and running this mechanical device. So there's all kinds of things that go wrong with any sort of machine, just like any sort of programming language that you're gonna have to be tinkering with and changing and working on. And the same is definitely true for 3D printing where it's step by step, you have to figure out why something didn't work. It could be the machine itself, it could be the way that it's programmed, or it could be your actual file itself wasn't a very good 3D printed file. So learning all those transferable skills can empower students to take those skills into other ways. So instead of just staying with 3D printing, they can go and work on something such as uh, designing something for a CNC machine, like this one that's kind of hanging behind me on the wall right there. Or they can make something for a laser cutter, or they can take those skills that they've designed and they can use it for creating uh, different types of animations and things like that, like digital renderings. Because once you can design in that 3D realm, it opens up all the different types of doors of designing things on a computer because you can take those skills and then that you might learn in one CAD program, such as Fusion 360, for instance, which is an excellent one. They can use that and then take that into Adobe Creative Suite and then all of a sudden they're using those kind of similar skills in a different 3D environment, but those skills, it's like you know using different types of programming languages or using different types of applications for a word processor where one thing is gonna be kind of similar. They're gonna kind of rhyme with each other back and forth. So that's the really awesome thing about having 3D printing is those skills with just digitally, that programming mindset, you can create all kinds of different things and all kinds of different programming applications. So the next thing that's really awesome about it is that actual mechanical aspect of it because you're learning how this machine works and you can take that kind of mechanical tinkering mindset and see, oh, wait a minute, this is just these series of motors and belts that's being programmed by a small little control board to do something. And then you can realize those steps go into so many different robotics applications, so many different applications of how machines are made and machines are created those skills that you learn from how a 3D printer works as a robot, those can be transferred to all types of different types of tinkering stuff that you'd wanna make, different types of prototypes that you might wanna be working on, different types of machine designs, because you can see how those things interact with one another. So the types of things that students are normally creating um, that we see are a lot of times dealing with prototypes. And that's also the same thing that businesses and individuals are dealing with too. So this, for instance, is a turbocharger that is designed and printed on a 3D printer. And this is for a company that actually makes custom car components for engines. And as they're kind of fitting everything in together, they didn't want to put their actual turbocharger in it. They wanted to use the 3D printed part so it can get banged up and actually act as like a placeholder inside of it. So it's perfect for something like that as they're like prototyping and testing and working on different things where you're actually working through that design iteration process, because that's where students are learning too. They're learning that, well, the first time you make this, it might not fit exactly like you want. So then you need to go back and change it. You need to make something different and then learn from your mistakes and then make it again and then review that process and reflect on what worked and what didn't and then try that again. So that engineering kind of like always improving mindset is also awesome um, for 3D printing in general, especially for uh, education and those different types of aspects of how you're gonna create something, this kind of abstract idea, and how you're gonna bring that, that idea into reality. So another way that 3D printing is being used a lot is to model complex things. So this, for instance, is a cell structure that was actually printed on something called a palette, which is a super awesome thing, a palette too. And it can actually take different colors of material and put them together. So. This is another example of a single, single color shell uh, cell. Now you can see the cell walls and things like that. So you can actually model complex things in a 3D program and then you can kind of see how those interact and then actually get to feel it and see it. So it jumps out of the screen or jumps out of the book that you're reading or something like that. You can actually interact with it and see, oh, that there's the nucleus. Oh, there's the mitochondria. You can see all those different parts of the model itself.
And then there's also really fun aspects of 3D printing. And that's one of the cool things that you can do as you're learning that process and working through it. And also some, one of the things that is really fun in the hobbyist uh, mindset is you can actually design stuff just for fun, just because why not? Like this Lego parrot. So this was actually designed in different pieces and then glued together. And it actually has a little Raspberry Pi in it that you can record something. Hey. And then if I can hear it, I don't know if it'll pick up. I might have to talk into it. Hey, -oh. oh, it would help if I turned it on. That'd probably help. Hey, oh, well, unless the batteries are dead. Anyway, it's a parrot with a robot in it, and apparently it's not working. So, you know, sometimes stuff doesn't work like you want it to. Uh, but this, you can kind of see the back of it where it's got the, uh, the screen that's in there. So you can do really fun projects too that teach you how to 3D print, where you can actually work on different things and different items like that. Uh, got stuff like movie props. So that's a way that things are used a lot in, uh, in 3D printing. And this is an awesome way. There we go. So just for fun, you can design different types of things and different types of objects that are actually being used. Pretty much every single Hollywood movie now and most plays use some sort of CNC, which is cutting big things like this machine that's on the wall behind me, this M2, or 3D printing to design specialized parts all the time because you can make something that you can imagine and then you can design it and you can print it. So cosplay is a huge way that 3D printing is being used, just like it's being used in the entertainment industry as well. Um, another way, a really practical 3D printing applications, which is also perfect for education and also perfect for ways that 3D printing is being utilized in the world today. So this, for instance, is made out of a flexible material and it's a guard for a nail gun to make nail guns safer. So this was designed um, and used by a local construction company. So this is a little guard that triggers when you push down on um, your surface. So then when it pushes on the surface, this little flexible trigger will in engage the, the trigger system to where it, the nail will actually shoot out of the gun to make sure that it doesn't actually just shoot, so you're not you know, shooting nails all over the place unless you're in your surface itself. So this is a perfect practical application of changing an existing object to make it 3D printable. Another way that's really cool is a bistable mechanic like this. So bistable means it actually has two solid states as one piece. So this can hold two completely static areas as one part. And it's got this really satisfying click that goes along to it too, which is pretty sweet. So this is a type of technology that you can use for something that you want to always mechanically work no matter what. So nuclear silos and missile launch systems use bistable mechanics that actually have these types of molded or 3D printed parts in them that can hold these two solid states where it actually has to be engaged by a switch, by a manual like cranking switch or something that you would crank for it to actually like open the doors on the silo or something like that. Because you never want an earthquake or something like that uh, or some sort of accident or some sort of programming where someone could hack into a system on something that's that secure uh, to be able to launch. So it has these types of mechanisms on it to where someone has to physically go in and like pull the levers and crank the knobs and things like that. Just like, you know, you would see in, in a Hollywood movie where they're just like cranking the knob to open it up. Well, that's real. Like they want to make sure that that's not something that can be digitally um, created or hacked into or a system like that. Um, so to make sure that even an earthquake wouldn't set it off, someone has to want this door to open or want this switch to actually click. And this is also a way that a lot of nano machines and nano devices are working to where you can put a different uh, sort of electrical current into that nano device that's a lot of times 3D printed, and then it will switch into that on off position, that zero and one. So it'll switch back and forth into that state, but it has to have an electrical current to switch. And if it doesn't have the current, it won't switch. So it doesn't just have to be something that's made out of plastic, but this is kind of a way that you can wrap your head around really complex ideas and really practical applications of 3D printing. So that's a lot of the ways that 3D printing is kind of being changed uh, in the way that it's being used, not only in our society, but all around the world. It's just one more way to create something where anyone with a 3D printer can bring something in their mind to reality and actually hold it in your hand. And you can be like, oh, well, that's what a plant cell looks like. So. If you all have any questions or anything, go ahead and put them in the chat and then we can ask any questions. And I know there's a little bit of a delay, so I'm gonna hang out and awkwardly sit and stare and see if there's any questions. Let's see.
Let's switch to, uh, instead of my uh, handsome visage, let's actually look at the 3D print that's going behind me. That's, a, that's way more interesting. There we go, it's getting bigger. As it's going up there, talking about some different stuff. All right, well, let's talk about like how the 3D printer uh, actually works because I talked a little bit about it being a robot. So you've got the nozzle right here where it's actually melting everything down. And then it's moving around on an X, which is side to side. So it's just a belt that's moving this nozzle around on side to side. It's got Y, which is this belt right here that's moving it forward and backwards. And then it's got Z, which is that up and down. And that's actually done by this motor back here and you can see this long screw, it's called a lead screw, that goes all the way up that moves everything around. And then there's this motor right here that pulls the material in. So this filament is pulled through with that. So everything is just belts and motors and a program that's running it all. Oh, there we go, that, learning how this stuff works. There's a comment tab I need to click on. Oh, there we go, that would help. All right, can I describe how to avoid that an object with complex shape moves while it's printing? So that is one of the toughest parts about 3D printing. That's making sure that this bed is actually calibrated. So that means that this bed height is not too close and not too far away with the nozzle. So they're actually these little adjustment knobs that are down here on the bottom. So these little knobs right here, so you can tighten or loosen those springs and that tightens or loosens the actual distance from the nozzle. And you want that to be as close as it can be without touching, pretty much. It's about two tenths of a millimeter. So super, super close to where that's gonna be. So that's all about calibration, which is probably 90% of 3D printing. So check out calibration on your bed to help with that. Alrighty, so this one. It's the thinnest material I can print. Um, and can you sand it down? You absolutely can. So the there are different types of 3D printers that are out there. So there are resin 3D printers that actually use um, a light source and liquid to harden something that can do super complex, super tiny shapes. And they can also do medical grade shapes as well. Or you can print out of this type of material. But this type of material here this is a 1.75 diameter and the material thinness doesn't really matter, but it's how it's actually coming out. So it's the nozzle itself that can determine that. So if you wanna make something small and complex, you can do that with this type of 3D printer, but a resin printer is how you can make something that's gonna actually be um, graded to be for like medical uses or for engineering uses where you really need to get less than a 10th of a millimeter. This can be about as accurate as a 10th of a millimeter. If you need to get into nanomillimeters, then you would need a more industrial 3D printer to be able to work on that. And even this though, you can sand down and smooth and actually post-process your prints to make them look really smooth. Absolutely. So 3D printers to buy, they usually start around maybe two or $300 for an introductory one, all the way up to thousands and thousands of dollars. But usually you can get a decent 3D printer for around five to 700 bucks. You can get a really decent 3D printer. So um, this is a Maker Made 3D printer. And then this one's by NWA 3D. So this one's about 800 and this one's 700. Um, and then you can also get something like this. Whoop, my camera fell. Uh, we've got, this is an Ender 3, which starts about like 200 bucks. Um, so you can get some different ones and different types of printers that you're gonna be utilizing. It, it's, there's a million different types of 3D printers out there. So I would just suggest finding one that has reliable support and is, is gonna be cost effective for you and what you're trying to look like. So how long did it take to print the turbocharger? 13 hours to print this thing. Yeah, so you can see it actually printed on this printer on this huge size and it took 13 hours to print. So it's multiple layers together to be able to print. So it does take a long time to print, which is one of the things that kind of detracts about 3D printing. It does take a little bit. Can you 3D print topographical maps? Absolutely, you can. I don't have mine in here, but uh, yes, you absolutely can. There is a sweet 
uh, website that's called Terrain 2 STL, Terrain 2 STL, that you can actually put in geographic locations and 3D print the topography of it. It's super awesome. You could also design that type of topography in a CAD program too. You could, uh, you could also do that. So it's bistable is the way that I've heard uh, I've heard it pronounced. I mean, you could call it bistable. I think that's probably what it's off of, but I call I I call it I call it bistable. Um, that's the videos that I've seen about it. That's how they pronounce it. I mean, that's one of the cool things about the human language. Um, I mean, y'all can say whatever word you want, like y'all. <laughs> um, so, what type of materials can be used? So, you can do anything that can change different states. So, this is a specially designed thermoplastic called PLA, which is polylactic acid. It's actually made from the polymers in corn that you can utilize. So, it's the cheapest to use and the easiest to print out of, but you can also use in more injection molding plastics such as um, ABS or, uh, or ASA, which they're not really the best for 3D printing, uh, but you can also use a material called PETG, P-E-T-G, and that's actually um, what uh, like water bottles are made out of, so you can print out of that as well. And then there are actually industrial 3D printers that use um, lasers to actually center metal beads together, and that's the type of stuff that like SpaceX and Boeing uses for their applications and their parts, um, as well as different types of polymers that you can use lasers or resins that are cured with light um, to be able to utilize. So there, there are actually seven different 3D printing um, types um, that are out there. So you can use any sort of material that can actually change its state and then hold its material properties. So some of them can only maybe change the state once or twice when you're like melting it and then reforming it, and others can only do it once. So it kind of depends on your application. Yeah, I didn't see the questions. I was in the uh, private chat tab in this uh, little area. Um, so yes, the, the Topo Max, like the, uh, the Grand Canyon map that is behind me. You can do some really cool stuff. I've seen some awesome things um, for design that like architectural firms and city engineers have actually like printed out some 3D topography to kind of see a visual representation of what their models and their designs are gonna look like. So you could do some really cool stuff. So yes, the turbo was in plastic and the final material was some sort of metal. Um, I'm not really exactly sure what turbochargers are made out of. I'm not um, a mechanical engineer, I'm not really sure, but I know that they use some sort of, of metal processing, probably um, um, some sort of milling um, process to actually make their final part on probably like an industrial milling machine. So we got how many decades till 3D printing, uh, like have till 3D printers can make 3D printers? Uh, now, you can do that now. That's one of the cool things about it. So this type of plastic you can actually utilize for 3D printers. But, but there's always a but, it's not the best type of material to actually design the mechanically sound parts out of because it's plastic and the plastic will wear down over time, especially PLA, it can melt if the temperature gets hot. Um, it's not really made to take all the stresses of the machine itself. So this has a lot of metal and injection molded parts. That's what makes this whole thing. It doesn't have any 3D printed parts on it. There are 3D printers and I, I think you can do about 77% of a 3D printer can be 3D printed, but there are some parts that you wanna make sure are made out of metal or injection molded plastics to make sure that they last longer. But for fun, you can totally do that. There are actually even concrete 3D printers that you can 3D print some of the walls and structures of buildings that then you can go in and put the support materials and windows and things like that. Um, and yep, just like uh, Mike is saying below you, RepRap is actually the process of 3D printing a 3D printer, which is where it came from. So 3D printing, it started when the 3D printing uh, uh, the uh, patent actually was it ended in 2009. So the patent was when that kind of expired for the first process of 3D printing. And the RepRap movement, which started in England, was actually 3D printing 3D printers where you can make one yourself. So desktop 3D printing has only been around 11 years. So who knows where it's going to be in another 11 years. It's just like the early computers of where it is right now. So it's really cool. So what is the current state of 3D printing organs or other biological tissues, and is it possible in the near future? So that is something that I am super, super excited about. So the process of 3D printing organs is we are literally not very far away from having like the Luke Skywalker hand where you can actually get a 3D printed biomechanical part. They're working right now through kind of what that looks like with the complex structures. So they can 3D print cell structures, and they've done that in the lab. 
where they, they, you basically use a bioengineered 3D printer. So anybody that's seen Westworld, where at the beginning of Westworld, they're like printing um, all of the different hosts and things like that. Uh, that's, we're not far away from that. Like that type of technology that they use is similar to what it will look like when we get it, which is pretty ridiculous and awesome. Um, what they're really working on now are types of 3D printed frames to grow the organs over. So there's a lot of really cool stuff with stem cell research where they can actually take your own blood and then they can take that blood and grow it over a 3D printed scaffold. So they can grow your like your skin, for instance, or an ear. They grew an ear out of that where they actually have the scaffold that then is gr the organ is grown around. And then that scaffold is made out of a dissolvable sugar type material. I'm not sure the exact material that it uses. And then it can actually dissolve to, so you can actually use that organ. So that's kind of the tech that they're working on now as to where they could get rid of the organ waiting list someday. And I think that's coming in the next like, a couple decades like i think it's going to be incredible like where you can actually work through that but there's so much science in the way that organic structures are made like humans and animals and plants are the most complex structures in the universe so trying to figure out exactly how that works is super super difficult but there i think that tech is coming in the next couple decades it's going to be really really cool and they're already using those for like 3D printed titanium vertebrae and 3D printed plates. All knee replacements are all 3D printed now. So if you need a knee replacement, that mold is, they they measure your knee and, and how that's gonna work. And then they go and get that knee replacement from a specifically 3D printed part that is exactly for those measurements. So those parts are already being used in medical applications, which is really cool because the, the it's actually not smooth, it's real bumpy. So the muscles can actually attach to it really well. So there's already like medical 3D printing applications that are really, really cool. So next one, beginner friendly programs, Tinkercad. Absolutely. Tinkercad.com is fantastic. So that is by Autodesk is the name of that company. That's what I always use um, with students. And, and when I talk to K-12 teachers and stuff like that too, when I was in the classroom, that's what I used too. Uh, it's an amazing like introductory program where instead of having to know how to do drafting where you would you basically draw something in 2D and then pull it out and make it 3D, you start with 3D shapes and 3D objects. So you can start with a triangle and then you can start with a cylinder you could put them together and then make the cylinder a hole and then now you have like a hole in your triangle that you can put your ink pen in so it's an awesome program it's free um yeah tinkercad.com is an amazing place to start and and it can kind of like light that spark too if you've got kids or know of some kids that are really into design and stuff but then they can move into other design programs too um that are just like that next step up like fusion 360 or like on shape is another one that's really great and both of those are free for schools and both of them are fantastic and a little bit more advanced so what about glass or amber? There are glass 3D printers and ceramic 3D printers, which is really rad, uh, where you can take a, a, a type, it has to basically work inside of a kiln. So if you've seen someone design something in a kiln, um, there's a thing really close to us called the Bluebirds of Happiness that's, uh, that's a, a, this like workshop. Uh, that's really close by to us. And it's fantastic to like watch how glass is actually made. And the glass 3D printers and the ceramic 3D printers, they do that. They actually work inside of a heated kiln chamber where things can actually come out in thick lines, just like you would be um, extruding that type of glass and like pushing it through to make your shape anyway. And then in that thick kiln, it creates it while it's all still in that kind of liquid malleable shape. And then the whole thing is cooled completely at once when the shape is done. So it's still kind of in the early stages of that. And a lot of it is used in more artistic ways that I've seen that it, that's being utilized. But it is really, really cool, the types of like glass 3D printers that are out there where you can do like some really amazing like crystalline chandeliers and things like that that I've seen are like super awesome. So how common are 3D printers in houses? So this is a great question that I see pop up sometimes. Uh, about as common as like 2D printers in houses because not lots of people don't have those either. Um, I don't think 3D printers are gonna be in everybody's house. Uh, it's still really complicated. So it's, it's not that easy like Star Trek replicator where you can be like, you know, make, I want a coffee mug, make me a coffee mug, you know, or, and you can, you know, the hand, handle broke off of my, of my cabinet, make me a new cab cabinet handle. We're not to that point yet because you have to actually go and measure the measurements of that handle and then you have to design it on a computer and then you have to import it into a program for your 3D printer and then you have to print it and troubleshoot it on your 3D printer. So there's a lot of steps to that. So if you are someone that likes to tinker with stuff and take things apart and put them back together, then yeah, totally. But a lot of people don't have 
don't have 3D printers in their houses. It's just like people don't have 2D printers in their houses because a lot of them are at work. So where a lot of ways that I've seen 3D printing taken off is being utilized in schools and in businesses that are working with any sort of prototyping and design. Um, just like when you know Xerox was around in the 80s and stuff, they, they had... Um, there are like copy machine places and stuff everywhere, which is which I've I've like read about, and that seems to be the kind of the same type of thing that's kind of going on now, where you can get some three D printed stuff because that that time that it takes to go through and troubleshoot and work on all of that, it is time consuming, and time is your biggest enemy um, when you're working on something, especially something that you want to kind of work on to try to make a profit off of, um, and that's where that. Digital design part is really cool because you can find designs that somebody's already created. There's great websites that are out there that already have 3D designs. Um, there's Makerverse that Maker that MakerMade has. There's Thingiverse, which has some cool stuff. There's My Mini Factory, which has some really cool stuff too. So there are places that you can upload your models to and even pay people to get the models that you want. But that the the time that it puts into and the money that you get out, if you're not in like a prototyping business, it can be it can take a little bit of time to kind of figure out that whole process and that whole thing. And it's absolutely not for everybody. Like I, I like I consider myself relatively tech savvy savvy when I started uh, doing three D printing, and it took me a bit to get my feet under me too. So it takes it takes some practice. So it's gonna be a while. It's not easy yet. We're working on it. There's some cool companies that are working on it, but um, it's we're not to the point where everybody's gonna have one. Yeah. So can teeth liners be printed like Invisalign um, or Smile Direct Club? Yeah, so totally. That 16 year old did design his own teeth. So that's a super awesome thing. So uh, his, I don't remember if it was his mom or his dad that was a dentist and they actually had a medical grade 3D printer in their shop that he had access to and that's how he designed it and printed it. So you could not do that on this type of 3D printer. You wouldn't be able to do that and utilize like those types of things because you can kind of see if I, uh, let me switch my camera, you can see how like you can only get about as thin as this. So you can kind of see this, uh, this thin part as it moves around. So that's not going to be the detail that you would need inside of your mouth. And also you can't sanitize this. So that's one of the big things with 3D printing PPE and things like that that are out there now. You can't sanitize these 3D printed parts. So you can't really do that on a desktop 3D printer. You'd probably need something that's probably going to be five to 10 grand to be able to make something like that. You can do PPE like this that isn't going to come excuse me, in any sort of contact um, with uh, something that needs to be sanitized. So this is be on your head. It's like an ear saver that can hold the uh, the kind of straps that, that you would have on a mask that, that helps medical professionals so that they don't have to have their ears pulled down like this for 12 hours straight. So um, something like this is awesome or like the face shields that kind of hold that on. Those are things that you don't have to worry about being sanitized that are perfect for those 3D printing applications. Um, but if you're gonna work on actually creating those 3D printed molds, you have to have a special printer and then you have to know exactly what you're doing like like he did when he made that the, his, his own Invisaligns. Um, but you can also do mouth guards. So there are football teams out there now that actually take 3D scans and then from that 3D scan, they'll create a mold and then from that mold, that 3D printed mold, they'll create the mouth guards. So um, both the Razorbacks uh, and the LSU Tigers, uh, last time I heard, both of them actually utilize 3D printed components in the way that they make their mouth guards. And I think that's kind of a common practice now. Don't completely hold me to that. I'm not 100% on that, but I know that that is one way that it's being utilized in like sports science too, where you can actually, you don't have to like boil a mouth guard and then bite down on it uh, anymore. You can actually just get a scan and then use that mold to uh, like pour resin in or something like that to be able to create different types of stuff. So yeah, it's some pretty cool stuff. So do we got like maybe one more question? Probably about time for like one more question. If anybody else has anything that's launched off. 15 minute, or it's not 15 minute gap. Yeah, 15 second gap. Let's switch over here. Instead of looking at me, let's look at this thing. Oh, and then speaking of Tinkercad, so this is actually made in Tinkercad. I'm printing this for a teacher workshop that I'm doing tomorrow. Um, we designed different pen holders from scratch and I'm printing this uh, for the follow-up workshop tomorrow. So you can easily make something in Tinkercad on tinkercad.com and then 3D print it. You just, it can export it as what's called an STL file. 
So I guess it's like a review of some of the things that I talked about. Let's just talk about some of the websites I talked about. So some different things that you can find resources. So um, the first two resources are gonna be shameless plugs nwa3d.com and makermade.com. Both of those have tons of free resources and tons of things that you can find for digital manufacturing to be able to utilize different parts and different things. And there is also uh, tinkercad.com is the program that I mentioned that you can design in as for beginners. And then Fusion 360, that's the one that I talked about for advanced modeling, advanced design. Um, and those are free for education and they're like super, uh, they're, the ticker cat's free for everybody, but Fusion 360 has like a low monthly cost um, if you want to get it. But the trial is awesome if you want to just test it out and kind of play with it and see what it's like. Fusion 360 is fantastic um, to utilize. And then as, as far as 3D printers go, um, you can find that it's kind of all over the place on there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of different 3D printers that are out there. So it's great to kind of ask around and people that you know and what 3D printers that they have and they utilize, or you can reach out to MakerMate or NWA 3D um, and then they can help you out as well and try to get you out going and like point it in the, uh, in the right direction of what you're looking for. And for beginners, uh, like a really awesome one to start off with is called the Ender 3. And it's probably, it's the one that I've seen is the most inexpensive that's actually reliable, but you're still going to have to tweak with it and get it to work uh, to kind of like get it going. But that's another printer that you can find that's kind of out there. That's in that like two or $300 range if you're looking to dive into it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Drew. You bet. Thanks for a lot of really, really cool information and demonstrations. That was really neat. Um, so it is time, everybody, for JavaScript Jeopardy. We're going to bring everybody back to join in on all of the fun here. Um, so like Drew was mentioning, there is an awkward delay between um, what you're seeing um, on YouTube and what we see on um, our dashboard. So there is about like a 15 second ish delay. Um, it's not really consistent. So there might be a little awkward pauses, but we're gonna try our best to keep you entertained while we're waiting um, for answers to come through. Um, so I'm going to share my screen again and we'll have, we have 10 questions for you tonight. Um, so I will start off with the first one. And if you know the answer, please uh, type it into the chat. First question, this React hook returns a memoized version of a given function that only changes if one of the hook's dependencies has changed. And remember in Jeopardy, you answer in the form of a question. We're gonna be disqualifying anyone who doesn't end with punctuation. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. And there are a couple of um, non-tech type, they're more like dad jokes, I guess is what we could call them, um, that are not in the Jeopardy format. So those ones we can give, give a pass to, but. All right, we got some answers coming through. You they're not questions, they're not questions. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But they are not the correct answer. Try again, very close. The first half is right. Who can Google know. fast enough? <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> Um, and I don't know, maybe maybe this is, I'm not a developer, so maybe it is the same thing, but the answer that I have is what is use callback? Is that the same, is that different? I don't know, sometimes I know there are different ways of saying something, question mark. Okay, next question. Let's see, Drew, do you wanna get the next one? Sure. Here you go. This programming language is known for its beginner friendliness, lack of braces, and definitely not being a snake. <laughs> do, 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 do. Oh, G-Man got the answer. Nice job. See that, that delay? It comes through after you thought there wasn't. I mean, somebody's got to get this one. This should have a lot of answers coming through in any minute. There we go. We got a lot. We got a lot of them. Yes. What is Python? 
Good job. All right, James, do you got this next one? Sure. What do you call a bee that can't make up its mind? This is one of those dad jokes. Nice. <laughs> Gotta get in the animal jokes, come on. <laughs> is the answer to this a programming language as well or not? No, this one is not a programming, no. This is when you can tell, tell grandma and get grandma laughing. Do you call a bee that can't make up his mind? Do you guys, do you guys want to take a guess? No I'm the only one who the answer. Huh? No one's answering it? No one answers it. I mean, maybe we'll get an answer. <laughs> I think maybe you might be right. Maybe someone will come in with some kind of bee. <laughs> Oh, what is a maybe? Ooh. Correct. And nice. they put it in a question. Very wow. nice, very nice, very nice. All right, Robert, this one's yours. All right. According to Google, this is the browser most often used to download Google's Chrome. Oh. <laughs> Ouch. Sounds <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> shade. <laughs> Got a few options here. Got to wonder yeah. if this is slowly changing with the uh, the recent updates. Yeah, I would um, I would assume. That would be but yeah, I guess too. <laughs> we have some correct answers. What is Internet Explorer? I.e. Oh. <laughs> Good job. All right, I'll get this next one. This is a blogging platform built on Ruby on Rails and launched in 2018 and has exploded in popularity in the developer community. What is the blogging platform? Using what is Chrome trick question, that's funny. <laughs> The blogging platform built on Ruby on Rails launched in 2018. What is Slack? Not quite. It's definitely popular in the dev community. Because yeah. the business world is all still using WordPress. <laughs> <laughs> Just can't move on. <laughs> what is <Yeah>. <laughs> I yeah. think I had a Geosities back in the day. <laughs> yes. What is Reddit? Not quite. Although that is also popular, I would concur. Can we give participation points to the we answer? Yeah, yeah, we can. So the answer is, what is dev.2? Reddit, if I'm not wrong, was built on Python. Gotcha, I did not know that. All right, Drew, back to you for the next one. It's more a than, it's more, let's see if I can speak. <laughs> <laughs> it's more than just a real-time database. And their logo is Fire as their platform. Have they integrated emojis into the real Jeopardy show yet? <laughs> um, it's coming soon. Yes. Yeah. Coming with the times. That's right. As they modernize their platform. Yes. What is Firebase? Correct. Ding, 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 ding. Ding, ding. All right. James. <laughs> <laughs> you got the dad jokes again. I'm the, I'm the only tech one in the group, and I get the dad jokes. I love it. I mean, why it's very fitting. Why do cows have hooves instead of feet? <laughs> I mean, it would just work out that way, you know. I did not plan that either, by the way. I had didn't know. I appreciate it. Why do cows have hooves instead of feet? Well, 
only cow joke I know is about brown cows and chocolate milk. So, <laughs> <laughs> do you guys have any guesses you want to give? Why cows have hooves instead of feet? Wow, they move fast. <laughs> oh, that was a good one. Okay, the answer is because they lack toes. Lack oh. toes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Robert, you're up. All right. No longer in the shadow of its older and more established brother, this IDE by Microsoft is one of the most popular among web developers. And let's kick off some music. <laughs> this adds some nice atmosphere. I like it. All right. Actually, that worked. That worked out really well on the timing. The answers are coming through. What is VS Code? And that is correct. Well done. All right. Next question: How do you comfort a JavaScript bug? Ooh, I know this one. This is actually our final question. Final question of the night. How do you comfort a JavaScript bug? Is this is kind of like, I feel like this is like a, kind of a, a dad joke, a tech dad joke. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the last one, VS Code was like, can 3D printers print printers since <laughs> platforms written in JavaScript for writing JavaScript? <laughs> <laughs> How do you comfort a JavaScript bug? All oh, right, you has got it. Yeah, that is correct. You console it. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all for playing along. I hope you enjoyed um, this fun game. And thank you for being patient with the awkward delay that we have from our live stream to our um, dashboard platform. And on that note, Robert, we are excited to uh, learn, get a tour of WebAssembly. And I will let you take it from here. Thank you, Drew and James, for playing along. You bet. See ya. Awesome. Well, hey, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. So I'm really excited to share with you a little tour of WebAssembly today, tell you a little bit about what WebAssembly is, how it works, and how to get started with using it. So before I start, just a little background about myself. So I'm a bioinformatics software engineer at a company called Mbite, and so we do a whole bunch of awesome genetic testing. And uh, fun fact, last year I published the book Level Up with WebAssembly. So if you're just getting started, uh, please check it out. So last year, uh, JavaScript, the state of JavaScript ran a poll with 20,000 developers. And one of the questions they asked was, how comfortable are you with WebAssembly? And interestingly enough, about 3 quarters of developers say they know what WebAssembly is but had never used it. 18% had never heard of it. And only 7% had a chance to use WebAssembly. And so although. WebAssembly was released in 2017. As you can see, the, the adoption is fairly slow uh, at this point. And so hoping to change that a little bit here. Um, so, so what is WebAssembly anyway? So I like to think of WebAssembly as really yet another language that you can run inside all browsers, just like JavaScript. Except, unlike JavaScript, it looks something like this. And so here I have some very simple code that doesn't look very simple to essentially define a string that says hello and then define a function also called hello. And all it does is return a string. 
Um, and so unfortunately, this looks very complicated, but you don't actually have to write WebAssembly directly. Instead, the way WebAssembly is meant to be used is as follows. So you take some code written in other languages and compile that code into WebAssembly so you can run it in the browser. So for example here, I'm showing some C code and defines a function, returns a string. I can use tools like Emscripten, which are, it's a really nice tool that lets you compile C and C++ code into WebAssembly. And so that's kind of the general idea is that people call WebAssembly a compilation target for languages like C and C++ and Rust and Go and others. So you can take code written in those languages and essentially port them to the web, which is pretty cool. What's also really nice about WebAssembly is that it's basically supported by over 90% of users, according to caniuse.com. So you can start using this in your applications today. Examples of applications with WebAssembly go all the way from porting entire desktop applications like Google Earth and AutoCAD, and even games like Doom 3, where these are very large code bases written in C++, and you don't want to rewrite all of that in JavaScript. And so WebAssembly allows you to avoid that. But WebAssembly also lets you take specific parts of your application that are written in JavaScript and in some cases allows you to optimize them. For example, at eBay, they had a barcode scanner code written in C++, they compiled it to WebAssembly, they can now run it on the web. And you know, in some cases, but that's not guaranteed though, in some cases WebAssembly can yield pretty good performance improvements. Okay, so now that we know what WebAssembly is, how do we actually start using it? So as a concrete example, I went on GitHub and found this repository that implements the MD5 hashing algorithm. And it's very simple. It only has one file, md5.c. All it does is it has a main function. The main function takes as input a string. It will take that string of arbitrary length, hash it into an MD5 hash and return it. That's basically all it does. And so the goal here is how do we go from this C code into this WebAssembly? And because we're using a C program, we're gonna focus on Emscripten, which is great for C and C++ code bases. If you use other languages, they have their own tools. And so how do we compile this to WebAssembly? Well, if you were going to take the C program and compile it just to regular binary, you would use something like GCC, which is a, a C compiler. Instead, Emscripten gives you wrappers around these common compilers. So for example, here, I'm using EMCC, which stands for Emscripten CC. And the syntax is basically the same, except my output file is the .wasm. When I run that, I can now execute my WASM file using a WebAssembly runtime like WASM time. And then I provide this program with an input string such as text, test, and hello, and it will return to me the MD5 hash of that string. In case, you know, this is all nice if you want to run it on the command line, but if you have an OJS server, you want to execute it as part of that server, so on your back end, what you can do is write the same Emscripten command, but the output is md5.js instead of .wasm. And what that does is it produces two new files, .wasm and .js. This .js code is essential, it's called a glue code. So what it will do is do all the work of initializing the WebAssembly module for you, so you don't have to, to deal with it. And so then we can test it by using node, again, basically the same thing. We call node on the JavaScript function that will initialize the WebAssembly and it will turn the string that we give it into an MD5 hash. Now, how do we actually run this in the browser? There's another really cool thing about Emscripten is that 
if the extension that you want to output this file as is .html, it will not only produce a, a .javascript file, which is the glue code, but also a .html, which will show you a nice console output and provide things like a canvas if you're porting graphical applications. And so then if I open my browser, I can just write JavaScript like this in order to call the main function from my original C program. And so module.callMain is a utility function that Emscripten essentially provides for you. And so if you imagine using WebAssembly in your application, this is kind of how you would do it, right? You would use module.callMain, give it an, an array of, of arguments, and, and then essentially use the output to keep going with your application. Interestingly enough, you can also run WebAssembly as a serverless function. And this is really exciting because here's what you could do. You could use a, a provider like Cloudflare Workers, and they have a whole bunch of tools to try to make this a little bit easier. Uh, so you can start by generating a template worker. Uh, then you can configure your API tokens and where you want to deploy the serverless function. You can then define uh, index.js, and this is essentially the entry point into your serverless function. This is basically what it looks like. So you can see that I'm defining a function that will take as input a message parameter. I will then call the main function on that message parameter and then return the output back to the user. And so then I can do Wrangler publish and boom, now I, can, I have an API endpoint that I can query with a specific message and it will return the MB5 hash. And so each time I call that API, it actually executes the WebAssembly function. And this URL is actually live, so you could test it out if you want to, mb5.robert.workers.dev. Specify a message, and it will return to you uh, the mb5 hash. Great. So as we've seen, you can run WebAssembly just on the command line. You could run it as part of a Node.js application. You can run it inside the browser. And you can even run it as a serverless function. And so that's really neat because it, although this is a very simple example, like calculating the hash, it, it shows you the flexibility that WebAssembly provides. OK, great. Now, I wanted to guide you through two examples of applications where we were able to use WebAssembly to either optimize performance or to make use of existing code without having to rewrite it. The first case study, this is an application called fastq.bio. This is a genomics application. Uh, and you can go there and input some DNA sequencing data. And it will try to give you a summary of the quality of the data. And so if you want a, a full story of be behind this particular case study, you could check out the Perf Matters talk I gave last year. But here's kind of the gist of it. This application can be broken down into three steps. Essentially, we ask the user to select some data file. We compute statistics on this file. And then we visualize the output. As you can imagine, the time consuming part is really computing statistics on this data set. And so what we wanted to try was to replace the existing JavaScript code that we had written to do this, this statistics and replace it with WebAssembly. So we took some off the shelf utility that is very commonly used in the scientific community and it's called CTK. It's written in C, so we compiled it to WebAssembly and then replaced it into our application. What we saw was that right out of the box, we got a 10x speed up just by switching uh, this computation from JavaScript to WebAssembly. And then through further optimizations, we were able to go up to about 20x speed up. So that's really good that we're able to get a 20x speed up. But there's also the code reuse aspect that's really interesting which is that 
at the time we wrote this application, we weren't aware of WebAssembly. And so we essentially had to rewrite parts of existing libraries that were written in C. And so WebAssembly allows us to avoid that. OK, so that's case study number one. The second case study is also a genomics web tool. Uh, so this one is more about looking at complex rearrangements in the genome. And if you remember, this is basically the same steps as the previous app, right? We have some data files that the user gives us. We parse those files and we visualize them. The only real difference here is that instead of having a single file, there are two. So one which is a very large 10 to hundreds of gigabytes of data, and then a smaller index file that lets us subset randomly from that large file without having to read it all into memory. Again, the part in red is the really compute heavy part. And so what we did here was we found, again, an off-the-shelf tool for processing this kind of very specific genomics binary file format. And that application is called SAMTools. Again, it's written in C, so we compiled it from C to WebAssembly. And lo and behold, we got a speed up of nothing. Um, it was basically either the same speed or a little slower. However, this was still a really big win for us because of the code reuse part. This SAMTools application I mentioned is 100,000 lines of code, and it's really complicated. And there's a lot of edge cases you have to think about. And so the reason this is a big win is for essentially three reasons. One is we don't have to rewrite any of that in JavaScript, which is fantastic. We also get feature parity. There, there are JavaScript libraries that reproduce parts of the C library, but not all of it. And so by using WebAssembly, we're able to just use that tool uh, right out of the box. And we benefit from continual updates, bug fixes, and new features. And finally, this is pretty important, the fact that this code base has been extensively tested and validated and is very much trusted by the community. And so if you were to rewrite this, you would have to make sure to do that process all over again. OK, so, so far we've talked about what WebAssembly is, how it can be very powerful. Let's talk about when WebAssembly is probably not a good idea to use. One particular pattern that I've seen repeatedly is that if your application needs to pass a lot of strings or otherwise complex objects between your JavaScript code and your WebAssembly code, it's probably not going to end well. Um, and, and the reason for that is that although you can access the WebAssembly memory from both JavaScript and WebAssembly, WebAssembly only understands numbers. And so you can't just take a string or an object and say, here, here's my string, here's my object. You have to essentially convert it into an array of bytes before you place it into memory. And just to illustrate how big of a difference this makes, when I talked about the 10x speed up that we got and then we were able to get it to 20x, the way we got it from 10 to 20x was essentially by reducing the amount of strings being passed in between our programs. Um, and so you can see how big of a difference this can have. And so if your application simply cannot work without passing a lot of strings or objects, that is going to be um, a big issue. On the other hand, certain applications are just perfect for this. So uh, I was recently working on some visualization of essentially a clustering algorithm where the input to that algorithm is an array of x and y coordinates, and the output is x and y coordinates. And these coordinates are just floating point numbers. And so in that case, there's no conversion back and forth between strings and numbers. And so that, that particular application was really well set for, for WebAssembly and its memory model. OK, so that's number one. The other thing to keep in mind is if 
you're looking at very large files and you need to load them all at once into memory, uh, just keep in mind that you know the WebAssembly is 32-bit addressable, so that means you can only use well, only, you can use up to four gigabytes of RAM, which is, is frankly quite quite a bit in the browser. And so you have to think about are there ways that I can analyze these very large files without loading them all into memory. Third thing I'll mention is if you need large reference files loaded at runtime, that's probably again not not a good idea. Um, so for example, there's a lot of genomics programs where you kind of need to load, for example, a human reference genome into memory. These can be up like from three gigabytes to 30 gigabytes in size. So it's just not gonna work and it's gonna take forever. Um, some applications like games also need to load a whole bunch of assets at the beginning, but what, what you can do there is essentially not load everything up front, but load things as you need them. Last thing I'll mention here is that you have to consider the overhead that WebAssembly will have on your code base and on your team. And the fact of the matter is that WebAssembly is not trivial, right? It's, it's a fairly complex uh, language and you're gonna have to add the WebAssembly's build tools to your build system, but also the build tools of the languages that you are compiling to WebAssembly, right? So that's gonna add complexity. And also given that only 7% <laughs> apparently of developers uh, have used WebAssembly, keep in mind the impact that this will have on your team, right? And think, not just about the short-term potential for performance improvements and potential code reuse, but make sure that you're aware of how you're gonna maintain that code base long-term. Great, so that's all I had. If you're interested in learning more, you can check out my book, Level Up with WebAssembly. Uh, that said, I also have a whole bunch of free articles and tutorials that you can check out at that link. And with that, I'll be happy to take questions. All right. First question is, oh, so is the function of WebAssembly to produce a compiled version of source code that will run inside the browser? Uh, yeah, that's one way to, to think about it, right? So you can take some code written in other languages, like C, C++, Rust, and so on. And what you compile, what you compile it to WebAssembly, and then that can run inside the browser. The alternative is essentially to rewrite it in JavaScript, because that's basically at this point, the only thing the browser supports is JavaScript or WebAssembly. Uh, there was a question about getting a copy of this presentation. Yes, sounds like the video will be available on YouTube. Awesome. Right about now, I'm wishing I had a 3D printer in the background I could point to. Um, So while we wait, maybe I can tell you a little bit about some other cool functionality in, in WebAssembly that you, you'll be able to use. Uh, one of them is threads. So obviously a lot of applications need to use multiple threads uh, in order to, to be faster. The way that WebAssembly implements threads is essentially using web workers. And so right now, most users do not have a browser that supports threads, but this will change very very soon. Um, just last month, Firefox announced it was gonna turn that on by default. 
in their browsers. And so, and, and in Chrome, it's already enabled. So I think we're just missing a couple more. And then you'll be able to essentially optimize your code even more by running them into threads. And ooh, there are more questions. Are there other targets for WebAssembly than a browser example on native iOS, Android? I see. Um, yeah, so, so like I, I mentioned, you can basically run WebAssembly wherever a WebAssembly runtime exists. So, you know, from the browser to the command line to Node to, you know, even serverless functions. Uh, I'm, I'm not very familiar with iOS and Android, um, but I do know that, for example, Swift has a way to compile it to WebAssembly, so that might be uh, one thing to, to consider. Okay, uh, next question. How does JavaScript and WebAssembly code intercommunicate? Right, so it, it depends on what you're trying to do. I would say if, if, you're, if communication, you mean calling a function, you can do that using exported functions from your WebAssembly module. So I, I showed the module.com main approach, uh, but Mscripten will also let you call like any exported functions from your C code if you, you just have to tag it um, to make sure that you can access it from the browser. If we're talking about passing data around, uh, the way that you could do that is essentially interacting directly with the WebAssembly memory. And usually you don't have to do that yourself. So like how I mentioned, if you have a lot of string passing, what I mean by that is that if you try to run main, for example, on a string, mscripten in the background will convert it into an array of bytes stored into memory. And then the WebAssembly uh, function can run on that. Okay, next question. So there is no real multi-threading on it. Um, Depends what you mean by real multi-threading. Um, so web workers do let you run JavaScript code in background threads or JavaScript or WebAssembly code in background threads. So in that sense, it is a real multi-threading, though it is not, it is only available in about 30% of, of users at this point, but eventually this will um, get closer to 90, hopefully. Okay, question from Brian. How does WASM manipulate the DOM? So right now it cannot directly manipulate the DOM. What you have to do is essentially use JavaScript as a, a middle layer. So you can call a JavaScript function that it will manipulate the DOM for you, but you cannot directly manipulate the DOM. There is a proposal in the works that will let you actually access the DOM basically directly from WebAssembly, but that's still very much a work in progress. Okay, question about accessibility. What about accessibility? Is there any support with that? Um, I guess I'm not too sure what you mean by accessibility. So, most of what WebAssembly does today is very computation heavy in that sense. So it doesn't really, uh, doesn't do things like manipulate the DOM, for example. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question or if you can be a little more specific about, create, uh, about accessibility. All right. Well, thank you, Robert. Thank you for talking to us about WebAssembly. Um, I can't tell you as a non-developer how much I learned from these 
these talks. So I, uh, I really appreciate you guys being here um, and joining us tonight. Um, and thank you to everybody who tuned in. Um, the video will be available on the Stop Media's website if you want to circle back and rewatch anything to make sure you didn't miss any good information um, that you were just um, wanting to follow up on. Um, and again, remember, um, oops, that's not the screen that I wanted. Um, but remember that we have weekly meetups um, every month. Um, each week is a different framework. Um, we have React, Vue, Angular, um, GraphQL, um, all a wide array uh, of topics that we cover. Um, and if you are interested in being a part of that um, and potentially um, joining to give a talk or teach us a thing or two, um, please reach out to us at hi at this dot dot co. Um, and on that note, um, we will say good night to everyone. And again, thank you for being here. Take care, everyone.